Well, blessings, everybody, and welcome to Answers. I thank you so much for joining with me. I'm Dale, and this is a program where we examine the Word of God. I've got my Bible open right here. I've got some things open over here of the Word of God. Well, we examine the Word of God and say, Lord, what is it that you want to show us today? What is it? Uh, what question is it that you're wanting to answer? And so that's the reason we call the program Answers is because we know that the Lord is the source for all uh, information for all knowledge, for all enlightenment. And I know a lot of people don't believe that. They say, well, that man had the ability to find things out and discover things. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that is a God-given ability. As a matter of fact, I'm, I am convinced of what the Word says, that He has given all of creation for man, okay, for man's purposes to discover, to explore, to learn of God and the ways of God by looking at all the various things within creation. That's the reason the scripture says that creation testifies of the glory of the Lord. Okay, Creation testifies and that uh, creation itself sings and glorifies God. Everything that exists has a certain harmonic frequency, a certain resonating that it does. And it's all a testimony of the glory of God. And so we, we testify in one way. I'm speaking right now and you're hearing a voice. And so that's resonating as a testifying thing. And creation does the same thing. And so when we uh, say that we believe that God uh, is the source of all knowledge, of all enlightenment, all illumination, all revelation, uh, that's the type of thing I'm talking about. That the Lord is the one who will guide us, that will lead us into truth. And so we know that he has given us his written word. And in his written word, uh, it's just so much information, folks. So much information that if we would just simply learn and live by it, our lives would be transformed. But we're not just limited to that. I mean, I know that sometimes that sounds a little heretical. So hear me carefully here, okay? Hear me carefully. I'm not being heretical or anything. But the Lord gives us his very presence within us. His very presence, his Holy Spirit is within us. And he says, I want to give you the Holy Spirit that will teach you, that will guide you, that will remind you of the things that I've spoken to you. And then he also gives us his body, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. And so the Word of God is manifested in a written form. The Word of God is manifest through his body, us encouraging, exhorting one another, okay? Iron sharpening iron. And then he gives us his spirit, which also is his word, because the Lord himself, Lord Jesus, was the word, and the word became flesh. And so with all that in mind, we approach the scripture and we say, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to reveal to us? What do you want us to look at? And so I thought we'd look at some, uh, uh, a really an extended passage today. There's no way we're going to get through all of it. Uh, bless you, Danny. Danny's, having, you. <laughs> Danny's over here having seasonal spasms. Uh, can you believe it's, what, it's supposed to be 85 today? And like a week ago, it was 45. You know, it's just that time of year in the Deep South. And so uh, what we're going to look at today, and perhaps in future weeks, uh, are, uh, is what the Scripture has to say in just one of the Gospels related to uh, Jesus' last days on earth. You know, uh, the time of celebration uh, in many churches of Easter is upcoming. Okay, that's just a few weeks from now. And so um, and there's nothing wrong with celebrating the resurrection of the Lord. As a matter of fact, every breath we breathe is a celebration of the resurrection of the Lord. And when we gather together to worship, we're celebrating the resurrection of the Lord. And it's okay to, uh, to have a particular Sunday where you emphasize a thing. But truth be known, truth be known, nowhere in Scripture are we told that thou shalt celebrate uh, Easter as a holiday. You don't see that anyway. Anyway, as a matter of fact, if you go and look at how Easter came about and what it, what happened and all that, you, you find some interesting things, okay? Same way with Christmas. Nowhere in Scripture are we told to celebrate, uh, in the, particularly in the way we do, uh, the birth of the Lord Jesus. Do we give thanks for it? Absolutely. Do we celebrate His coming? Yes. But when I celebrate His coming the first time in Christmas, I am really celebrating and anticipating His coming again. And we've talked about that in times past. But and with those two big things, the church looks upon both those being huge points in the time of a, of a sacred year and a sacred calendar. Neither one of those are we told to do within Scripture. But we do have seasons. It's good to have seasons of reflection upon a particular kind of thing. And so I thought it would be a worthy thing to examine and look at some stuff uh, related to that because there's a lot of questions that arise particularly out of what is often referred to as the Holy Week or the last few days, last seven days, the last ten days that the Lord Jesus Christ was here upon earth. 
A lot of times people are even scared to ask these questions. I mean, they really are. They're scared to ask the questions. If they do ask the questions, uh, one particular thing I think maybe we'll look at today was well, something that crossed through my mind for years and years when I was growing up and I wondered about it. And, and I'd asked a couple times and I'd go, oh, it's all, you know, it's cause of this, we've done this and that. And I went, oh, okay. And then it kept bothering me because it just didn't seem to be quite correct or quite accurate. And then I found a more accurate understanding of it, which still in and of itself was inaccurate and I was confused. And, and now I think I know what the scripture says about it. So now I've got you totally confused, right? And you're thinking, what is he talking about? Well, let's look into it and we'll see. We're going to be reading in Matthew 26. Now, this is really interesting because the first verse of Matthew 26 says this, And it came about that when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples. So he had finished all these words. Well, what are all these words? Well, the previous two chapters, Matthew 24 and 25, what is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse, a portion of scripture that we have been sort of dwelling around here now for some 15 months. I remember January a year ago, I thought, I'm going to look at this all of that discourse. There's some things I think we need to understand right here. And I thought we'd spend six, seven weeks on it. We spent eight or nine months in this time together right here just examining that in corollary scripture passage. And we still have only scraped the surface of what's really being said. So what's happening here in the 26th chapter? Jesus, after he had finished what he said there in Matthew 24 and 25. Now remember what he said. The disciples had come to him and said, Master, when are these things going to occur? What's going to be the sign of your coming again? And what's going to be the sign of the end of the age? Jesus answers Matthew 24 and 25. By the end of it, he's told them everything. At the very beginning, he tells them the panorama of all the history of what's going to happen. He tells them, don't be deceived, don't be frightened, but here's what's going to happen. Then he gives more detail. And then at the end of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, he tells them two big things. Be on the alert and be ready. Well, be on the alert and be ready for what? Well, for his return. Well, he's telling them this and he hadn't departed. But he had been telling them. He'd mentioned two times, maybe three times by this time. I can't remember if it's two or three. He'd already told them that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He was going to be uh, turned over to the Jewish leadership. And they were going to do some things to him. And eventually he was going to be killed. Well, the disciples were hearing it, but they didn't want to hear it. So now it's at the end of this discussion that he had with them that he says, here's what's going to happen. You know that after two days the Passover is coming and all and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. So we know the timing right here is two days before Passover and, it's right before, and he tells them that he's going to be killed and he tells them how he's going to be killed. He tells them he's going to be crucified. Can you imagine what the disciples were thinking? They're sitting there after this wonderful thing that he was telling about his coming again, which they're confused enough about that because he hasn't left yet. Is he really going to leave? Is he coming? What's he talking about? And he says, you know that it's two days to the Passover and I'm going to be delivered up and I'm going to be crucified. Now listen to this. Then the chief priests and the elders and the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him but they were saying, not during the festival, lest a riot occur among the people. So, the religious leadership, a high priest, and the religious rulers were trying to get Jesus, and they wanted to capture him, and they wanted to kill him. They'd already tried to embarrass him. They already tried to discredit him in front of the people. They tried to do all this, and everything failed. So their only recourse now in their mind was, we need to kill him. But we can't kill him because it's the festival time. It's the time of the festival, and that's going to be really important because I'm going to deal with that in a minute to explain some stuff that I think will answer a question, the one I was referring to a while ago. But first, we have a little parenthetical account right here. So what you see is that Jesus is telling his disciples this. Well, then the scripture tells us, well, the leadership had been meeting, and they had decided this. It's not necessarily chronological. He's just telling us what had happened. Now, verse 6 of chapter 26. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, and she poured it upon his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this, and they said, Why this waste? The disciples were so much like we are, so much like religious leadership. They, they're all indignant about how somebody chose to worship the Lord and chose to do something. We don't know from this gospel, but one of the other gospels tells us who was actually saying this kind of stuff. 
So why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed for me. For the poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. He had told them that he was going to be dying. He'd been saying that for quite a period of time now. Then he says, okay, two days from now, Passover is coming, and I'm going to be crucified. Now he's saying that this woman who came in and poured this alabaster vial, and generally speaking, it's understood, we don't know exactly, but it's generally understood, we believe, that it had a value. That perfume had a value of a year's salary, a year's wage. Can you imagine that amount of money? And so the disciples were indignant. We have this happen all the time. People say, can you imagine how many people we could have done this with and done this with and done this with? And they just don't understand the heart of just worshiping, just giving all you have unto the Lord. But the Lord said there's more to this than even she understood. She's preparing my body for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. And it's proven to be true. It's in the Gospels what had happened to this woman, what she did. We remember the sacrifice that she gave. And Jesus gave the interpretation as to why this was to be done. Preparing his body for burial. Now watch this. Then, then, notice there's a little timing phrase there. Then one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief, pray, chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me to deliver him up to you? And they weighed out to him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Now, this is just me. I think what happened right here, uh, Judas was the one that was carrying on the discussion. He was the one that carried around the money of the disciples. He carried the money back. He also pilfered from that bag. Okay, We found out that he was not honorable in the way that he was handling these things. And so I think that when this happened right here and Jesus said, no, 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 no. The disciples were indignant. Judas leading the indignation, okay? That when this happened right here, that just sort of, Judas said, okay, that's enough. I really have quite sympathy for Judas. And we'll see as we go along in, in, in future times together in examining this, what happens right here. There's some amazing things that occur right here. I think that he was trying to expedite some things, okay? I do believe, as you see later on, that he had no intention of getting Jesus in a situation where he was to be killed. I, that was not his intention at all. He did betray him, but I think he betrayed him to try to initiate and try to get Jesus to establish the kingdom that Judas wanted. And you say, well, why in the world would he do that? Do we not do the same thing? Do we not do things trying to get the Lord to do what we think he needs to be doing it in the way that we think would be best to do it? And you say, oh, no, we never do anything like that. Well, uh, perhaps I have sat in uh, too many committee meetings and, and too many church leadership things and been involved with too many things. I, I've seen that far too often. We will do things, and then we will ask God to bless it when he wasn't the one who initiated it to start with. So what we have here is Judas has now decided, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to expedite this. 30 pieces of silver. You know, the average workman, a month of his wages. The price of a slave. When you look in the Old Testament related, it's actually the price of a slave that he was willing to save Judas for. I mean, uh, to betray Jesus for. Now, I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break right here. When we come back, I'm going to put some things together right here for us that help explain perhaps why there's some confusion over what we do related to what we call a celebration of Easter, okay? So stay with me and I'll be right back in a minute.
You have always wanted to play the piano, but thought it was too late. Or, in the past, you played the piano, but you do not play anymore. Or, you've always considered yourself to be unmusical, yet there is something driving you to express yourself through music. It is not too late. Now is the time. Simply Music has come to Alabama. Coleman is the only Alabama location of this revolutionary method. Come, join us, make music. Welcome back to Answers. We are in Matthew 26 today, and I'm going to begin at verse 17. This is really important, so we just got a few more moments right here, so hang with me, okay? Keep your brain intact. This is not complicated, but it does require a little reasoning through and thinking through and a little backing up to the Old Testament. Listen to verse 17. Now, the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now this is really, really important. So let me just talk to you here for a second. It says that on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said, when do you want us to prepare the Passover? In the Old Testament, in the Levitical law, the Lord gave the nation of Israel seven festivals. There were seven feasts. We call them the Feast of Israel. They're actually the Feast of the Lord. Okay, the Feast of the Lord. And there's four of them that appeared in the springtime, and there's three in the fall. Okay? These are still celebrated by Jews to this day. The four spring feasts were completely and totally and absolutely fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ when he came the first time. Because every element of these feasts, every element points to something about Messiah coming. And that's the reason the Lord had them celebrated. Because whether they knew it or not, there were elements of it that pointed to Messiah, to the Savior that would be coming. So when Jesus came the first time, he fulfilled the first four. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and a Pentecost. Okay? The fall feast, the last three feasts, will be fulfilled when the Lord returns the second time. And we'll talk about that later, okay? But what's interesting is the Lord gave very precise stuff. He told them on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, which is right around our March and April. The months don't sync up, so don't worry about that. This is just a calendar that the Hebrews had. On that 14th day, they were to prepare the Passover lamb. And he went into great detail. On the 10th day of the month in the sun, they were to select the lamb that was to be without blemish. And they were to keep that lamb and watch that lamb for four days. On the 14th day, at mid-afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they were to sacrifice that lamb. On the 14th day of the sun, now hang with me, this is really, really important. On that 14th day, they were to prepare the lamb. And then they were to sit down and eat the meal. Now remember, the Hebrew day begins at nightfall. Okay, begins at nightfall. I'm just going to use general numbers. It would begin, say, at 6 p.m. That's when their day began. And so on the 14th day of the sun, they were to sacrifice the lamb at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They would prepare the meal. They actually call that the day of preparation. You'll see that phrase in the scripture. On that day of preparation, they would prepare, then they would sit down. When they sat down and eat, it became dark. Then it became the 15th day of Nisan. On the 15th day of Nisan was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, that would be the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so uh, that lasted seven days. That Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day and the last day of it, was to be a holy day unto them. The scripture tells us this over in Leviticus chapter 23, was to be a holy day unto them. It was actually considered to be a Sabbath day. That is so important, so important for how we celebrate things. Because here's what occurred. When they, when they come on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread started on the 15th in the sun, but they said, how are we going to prepare the Passover? Listen to this. On now the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came. So is that the 15th? Then to prepare for the Passover? Well, the day of preparation was the 14th. It looks like the days are backwards, in other words. How can that be? Let me explain something to you. If I were to look at you right now and say, well, in, in, the, in a certain time of year in our culture, we have the holidays. If I say the holidays, most people are going to be thinking the same time period. Thanksgiving, 
Christmas and New Year's. And we just sort of use this generic holiday kind of thing. Well, what had happened by the time they came along uh, to the New Testament times right here in Matthew, they looked upon Passover, which preparation was the 14th day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread began the 15th day, but you were eating the meal that you prepared on the Passover. They just looked at them as being synchronized together, and they are. And quite often they would say just the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they included that day of preparation at the beginning. So here's what happened. At this point in time, I believe it was the very first of the day of the Feast of uh, uh, Preparation, the Passover, the 14th day of Nisan. It was on the 14th day of Nisan that they came to him. And Jesus says, well, here's verse 18. Go into a certain city, a uh, city to a certain man, and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand, and I want to keep the Passover at your house of my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them. And they went and they prepared the Passover. So what they did is they went in and they prepared for the Passover meal. And you say, oh, I know what that is. That's the time when uh, the disciples sat down with Jesus and they had this meal and everything, and Jesus instituted, that's the word we always use, he instituted the Last Supper. You don't really see the phrase Last Supper in the Scripture. We call it the Last Supper because it was the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. But there's a couple things I want you to be aware of right here. There's a couple things I want you to understand related to this, okay? One of the Scripture doesn't say overtly, overtly, so I'm not going to separate fellowship with folks over it, but we'll deal with it first. When they sat down that night to eat of that meal, that was the night, the beginning of the 14th day of the sun. Okay, it's the 14th day of the sun. I do not believe that Jesus was eating the Passover meal proper. Okay, the Passover meal that the Jews would be eating, they were not sharing that meal that evening. Now, they might have had elements of that meal. They might have done all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of commentators that, that have acknowledged this through the years that no, Jesus wasn't eating because the day was wrong. The next day was the Passover. The Passover lamb would be killed at 3 o'clock later that same day, and they would sit down and eat. But Jesus was to become the Passover lamb. Jesus actually died at the moment when they were supposed to be killing the Passover lamb. Everything was so perfectly timed within the Word of God. Okay, And so what they were sitting down to eat that night was just a meal. Sort of like this. You might have a Christmas meal at your house for lunch or something like that, and all the families together. But at Christmas Eve, you quite often have a meal together with everybody around. Well, they sat down that evening and ate, but it was not the Passover meal. Now, some people will say, well, it was, but Jesus just decided to do it a day earlier. I don't think so. I don't think so. And we'll look more next week about what happened at that meal. So Jesus sits down at the beginning of the 14th day in the sun. The sun had just gone down, and they have a meal, and he says some stuff. But here's the thing that really uh, sort of, I think, will help some people, and the big answer for the day. Jesus was killed on the 14th day in the sun. And they said, we've got to get him off the cross, religious leadership did, because the next day is the Sabbath, right? And it's exactly right. But that Sabbath was the high holy day of the 15th day of Nisan, not the weekly Sabbath, okay? It wasn't the weekly Sabbath. The weekly Sabbath began uh, what we call sundown on our Friday evening through Saturday. That's the reason people think that Jesus died on a Friday, and he did not die on a Friday. Okay? Jesus died on Wednesday afternoon. He was crucified on Wednesday afternoon. Now, some people say Thursday, and there's an argument for that, but I don't think it's a real strong argument, and I think it's Wednesday afternoon. And you say, well, how can you know that? There's no way to know. Has the church been wrong all these years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the church was wrong about a lot of things for a thousand years, and the church continues to be wrong in some things because they refuse to see it. Okay? But it's real simple. Uh, uh, Jesus gives us major hints about all sorts of things, and here's a major hint that the Lord gives us. And Matthew 13, I think is where it was, the religious rulers had come to Jesus, and they said, Lord, uh, Rabbi, uh, give us a sign. We want a sign from you. And Jesus said, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah, because the Son of Man will be on the belly of the earth three days and three nights. See, as a kid, I never could understand, because I knew that three days thing. I couldn't understand how Jesus could die on a Friday afternoon and be resurrected on a Sunday, and there'd be three days. Well... People said, well, it just it is. Don't worry about it. Well, years later, I was studying it. And then people said this. They said, well, any portion of a day in the Jewish mindset counts as a whole day. And for years, I thought, well, okay. But even that bothered me because it, it was inadequate and it was incomplete. Because it was not quite the total truth. Jesus died on Wednesday afternoon, our time. Okay, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. When the sun went down, it became Thursday. Evening and day, Thursday. 
evening and day, Friday. Evening and day, Saturday. When the sun went down on Saturday night, it became Sunday. I believe sometime shortly after sundown, he was resurrected. And you say, well, that can't be. That can't be because the scripture says that uh, the women came to the tomb early in the morning, right at dawn. They came to the tomb. Yeah, that's when they came to the tomb. That's not necessarily when the Lord was resurrected. And you say, well, well yeah, that's when the rock was ro rolled away. That was when the tomb was uh, exposed. The rock was rolled away. The earthquake happened. The angels were there to speak to the ladies that came up to reveal the tomb to be empty. The Lord didn't need the stone to be rolled away to be resurrected. We actually don't know when he was resurrected. I think he was three days, three nights, totally complete days, totally complete nights. And when the sun goes down and it became Sunday, at some point in time, he was resurrected right then. The ladies come and find him and they go back and tell everybody. And so that right there sort of gives us some insight as to why it is that we celebrate on Friday. Because see, people think that that Sabbath day was the weekly Sabbath, the Saturday Sabbath. No. The Sabbath was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There were two Sabbaths that week. The High Holy Day of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the weekly Sabbath. The next week there would be two High Holy Day, I mean two Sabbaths. The High Holy Day of the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the weekly Sabbath. And you say, well, does it really matter? Well, yes and no. It doesn't really matter in relationship salvation, things like that. But why not accurately handle the word of truth? Why not know what the truth is? You know, we do the same things. And honestly, folks, I think it's quite serious sometimes because we'll sit there and put up wonderful little uh, like Christmas crash or something like that and have the, the, the kings from the Orient there at the manger with Jesus when the word obviously says that that's not the way it happened. And people say, oh, it's just a good story. But here's what we're sort of communicating. We're communicating. We're willing to sort of fudge on the details of this just because it's a good story. So if people can't trust us with the little details like that, then how are they going to trust us with the big details and the real truth? Does that mean that we should never celebrate anything on Friday? No, 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 no. I, I, I have done many, many a good Friday service with people because the idea is we just gather together and we remember what the Lord did for us, okay? But when we're looking at the scripture, why not look and see what the truth is? See what has happened? Because Jesus is and was the sacrificial lamb, he was offered up as the Passover sacrifice. Offered up as the Passover sacrifice. So anyway, just take these things before the Lord and see what he has to say. Let me pray for us very quickly. Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for your truth. And I thank you for bringing everything together in this way. Lord, you have been so good to us. And we just bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me. And we'll continue through this next time. So I'll see you then. Goodbye.